Welcome everybody. In this video I'm going to give you a quick overview of what's new in Lightroom 4. I'm going to try my best to resist my temptation to explain how to use the new features to keep it short. On my website you'll find a recorded version of one of my Lightroom 4 beta webinars. Very little has changed since then, so watch that for more details. You'll also see blog posts over the coming days highlighting new features. I've also just released the Lightroom 4 version of my popular Lightroom Fundamentals and Beyond workshop on DVD, and plan to also release a series on Lightroom's output modules. Okay, so let's get started. Now the most dramatic change in Lightroom 4 is not a Lightroom 4 feature, it's the pricing of Lightroom 4. Lightroom 3 was $2.99 for the full version and $1.99 for the upgrade. Lightroom 4 is now $149 for the full version and $79 for the upgrade. So 50% off on the full version price makes Lightroom now accessible to a much broader audience and an upgrade price of $79 makes the decision to upgrade a much easier one, at least for me. There's a lot of power just in the changes here in the develop module for Lightroom 4 that makes $79 a no-brainer for me. And then there are other nice features and enhancements as well. So let's go ahead and go into the develop module. The first thing that has changed is that we have new tone controls here in the basics panel. Much more powerful. So here's a photo that I took before I've done any work on this photo. Let me show you the best that I could achieve using the old way of doing things with Lightroom 3. Not bad, I was happy with it at the time, but using the basic panel I couldn't get enough light into the shadows, and if I zoom in on the clouds you can see that there's almost no detail in there, and that I have odd halos along the trees. That's because I used a lot of recovery and fill light. Now let me go ahead and go to the 2012 version, the best that I could do using the basics panel with Lightroom 4, and you can see that I get a lot more light into the shadows, and if I zoom in on the clouds here, I've got more detail in the clouds and no odd halos along the trees. Recovery and fill light are gone. We now have highlights and shadows. I have a video out there on using the Lightroom 4 basics panel. Quick tip to you is set exposure first for the midtones, not for the white point. When you have a photo that you worked in 2010, if you want to update it to the new way of doing things, you'll update the process version. And I would caution you not to update them all at once, because you may see significant changes in your photos. So that's the new basic panel tonal controls. Clarity also has a new algorithm behind it. It's more powerful, and you'll find that it doesn't produce harsh shadows along edges of things. So I'm going to go ahead and go on to another photo here and talk about new changes in the adjustment brush. So I've set the white balance on this photo for the saxophone player, but because this was shot under mixed lighting, the drummer is still very blue. So I can go into the adjustment brush or graduated filter now, and I can change the white balance locally. So I'm going to reset all the sliders, just go with positive temperature here, and you can see that I can very easily shift this white balance. So I'm very excited to see that. Notice also that we have more tonal controls. We have highlights and shadows in here so that we can be more precise in terms of what we're affecting when we're painting. We also have noise reduction and moiré. So back in this example where I underexposed this balcony, I would use the detail panel to get rid of the average amount of noise, but then I could come in with positive noise reduction in the adjustment brush and paint out additional noise that I have in the shadows. Now moiré is the pattern that a digital capture can produce when there's already a line pattern in the subject. So let me go ahead and zoom in here a little bit more, and you'll see this red, yellow, and blue pattern here. So I can paint with positive moiré here and very easily get rid of that problem. Now that was something that I used to have to go to Photoshop to get rid of, and now I can get it done in five seconds. So great new features in the adjustment brush and graduated filter. Let me next go down to the tone curve. This is an advanced feature that's been added. I'm going to go back to the balcony shot and zoom back out. Then I'll go down to the tone curve. The tone curve has always had slider view, 
In Lightroom 3, we got the point curve for people that understand how to work with a point curve. But we only had RGB, meaning we could only brighten and darken. Well, now in Lightroom 4, we have individual color channels. So we can shift the colors of ranges of tones. So I want to warm up the shadows. I want to take out blue. So I can put a point here on the curve down in the shadows, drag it away from blue towards yellow, and then I can bring the midtones back up to not being affected at all. Now if I hit the switch on and off and you look at the side of that couch, you can see that I was very quickly able to warm up the shadows. For Power Curves users, I can imagine this is going to make you very happy. The next change we have is fairly small but important. It's down in the Lens Corrections panel. I'm going to go ahead and go to this photo here, and I'll zoom in here. This photo has color fringing. That's chromatic aberration created by my lens. It used to be that this was corrected by the lens profile in Lens Corrections, or by manual sliders. The manual sliders are gone, the chromatic aberration has been taken out of the profile corrections, and there's a new checkbox here to simply remove it with one click. And it does a fantastic job, better than I could ever do with those manual sliders. So let's go ahead and go to the last change in the develop module, which is a big addition, and that's soft proofing. So soft proofing allows me to preview what my photo is going to look like in output what it's going to look like when I print to a particular printer and paper combination with what's called a printer profile, or what it's going to look like when I export it as a JPEG in sRGB or another color space. Now, when we export to share our photos with people, generally we're exporting to the sRGB color space, which doesn't allow us to have colors that are as saturated as what Lightroom allows us to have. So we can preview those output effects here in the develop module. What we would do is turn on soft proofing here at the bottom and we get a new options box here. First I can set my printer profile or my color space here. Let's say I'm printing to my printer with enhanced matte paper. Once I set the profile or the color space, I can come over and turn the checkbox on and off for soft proofing to see how my photo changes so I can see it becoming more muted. I can also right click on the background here and change the background color. So if I'm planning to map this photo, it might be more appropriate to view it against a white background. I'm going to right click now and change it back to 50% gray. With the profile selected, I can hover over this indicator to see what colors are too saturated for that particular output device. I can hover over this indicator to see what's too saturated for my monitor, in this case nothing. Then I can simulate the loss of contrast that naturally happens when we print a paper. Now all of this is explained in my soft proofing video on my Lightroom 4 Fundamentals and Beyond DVD. There's a conceptual discussion on all of this and then the how-to in detail. I know it's a lot for people that have never seen soft proofing, color spaces, and printer profiles. But if you have, once you choose a profile, you can choose the different rendering intents to see which one is going to work better for your photo. If you decide based on your soft proofing that you want to do some more work on the photo for output, you can create a proof copy, which is a special virtual copy that remembers your profile and rendering intent, and then you can continue to do whatever additional work you want to do for output purposes. Now let me go back to my master photo and just point out that by soft proofing, not with a printer profile, but with a color space, with sRGB, you can address that question of why do my exported JPEGs look washed out compared to what I see in Lightroom. You can preview what they're going to look like when you export them and then do any further adjustments to make them look as good as possible before you do the actual export. Very powerful new feature that I can't do justice in a short period of time. Now I'm going to go ahead and move back to the library module and I'm going to talk about new video support. So since Lightroom 3, we've been able to import videos into Lightroom, rate them, flag them, and do other library module tasks, but we haven't been able to play them within Lightroom, trim them, or develop them. So now we can do all that. To start with, Lightroom has added support for Sony's AVCHD video format. With this addition, Lightroom now supports most camera video formats, including smartphone formats. 
So I'm going to go ahead and increase the size of my thumbnail here and go to a video. And you'll see as I hover over the thumbnail that I get a preview of the video. It shows me how long it is. I can double click on it to take it into loop view. And I have a control bar now below here. I can click to play it here in Lightroom and I would hear the sound as well. I can click and drag to move through the video. I can trim the video. I can make it shorter by clicking on this wheel here, selecting where I want the video to end, clicking and dragging to cut off the end, selecting where I want it to begin, clicking and dragging to specify that the beginning should be cut off. Now all of the work in Lightroom on videos is non-destructive. Lightroom isn't touching your original videos. This only affects copies that you export. Notice that I can't trim anything from the middle. That's beyond Lightroom 4. Another thing I can do is capture individual frames as JPEGs. Let's say I want this frame here. I'll click on the square and say Capture Frame. And now in the film strip here, I also have a JPEG. Go back to the video. I can also choose a frame and click here and say set poster frame which is simply the frame that shows up in the thumbnail here. The next exciting thing about video support is that I can develop my videos here in Lightroom. I can't go to the develop module directly with them but I can use the quick develop panel. So I'm going to go ahead and warm up this video and reduce the exposure a bit etc. I can also apply develop presets that I've created in the develop module the Lightroom team has also provided some presets in here specifically for videos, but you can apply any presets. Now, not all develop settings are supported, so presets that have develop settings not supported won't be applied. Now, there are some tricks for actually being able to use more controls in the develop module than you see here. So stay tuned for upcoming blog posts or watch my video in my Lightroom 4 Fundamentals and Beyond series for those tricks. Finally, you can export copies of your edited videos. First, here in the Library module, you can use Publish Services to export copies of your videos directly up to Facebook and Flickr. And you can also export copies to your hard drive by using the Export dialog. There's a video section here where you'll specify the format. DPX is to export individual frames out to your hard drive to import into Adobe Premiere. Most of us are going to choose H.264, though, to export MP4 videos that we can share with people. I'll cancel out of this. Now let's go ahead and move on to the Map module, brand new in Lightroom 4. I'm going to click at the bottom here, and I'm going to go to All Photos, so that we're actually seeing or having access to my entire catalog of photos here. And you'll see that I can view my photos on the map. If I hover over a pen, I get a preview, put my mouse in the center and scroll through. I can see all of the photos in the area. There's a lot of functionality in here to get, of course, down to the level of detail of individual photos. If your camera does not assign GPS location to your photos, you can simply click and drag them to the map to assign GPS location. Now, it's not just a cool visual thing as I thought. It's actually very handy in my workflow. Once you assign location to photos on the map, which means assign GPS location, Lightroom can automatically populate for you country, state, city, and sometimes sublocation or neighborhood in the metadata for your photo. So as I drag this photo to the map, Lightroom went out to Google Maps to find out that this was in Brennan, Washington in the United States. Now, because it's in the metadata, it's searchable. So I can search for all my photos from Brennan, Washington. If I take the time to drag my photos to the map, I no longer have to take the time to keyword them with location. I also have saved locations here that allow me to jump to photos from particular locations. So this just jumped me straight into downtown Seattle to show me my photos in my downtown Seattle neighborhood. I can also make these neighborhoods private, so when I export photos, it strips off this location information. In terms of where the map module fits into my workflow, after I import photos and evaluate them, decide which ones are pics, maybe I would assign the photos to the map and then continue on from there. One additional feature of the map module is that when I click on a pin, it selects those photos here in the film strip and then I can go do whatever I need to do with these photos. 
So this location with 53 photos is the Seattle Public Library. So now I could click back on the library module, jump down to the keywording panel, and add Seattle Public Library to my keywords for that selection of photos. Then I could go back to the map module, click on another selection of photos, and go keyword those. So it's a handy tool, not only for assigning information, but for selecting your photos based on location to go do other things, such as keywording, building a slideshow, etc. OK, let's go ahead and jump to the, the brand new book module. Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and go into a different collection of photos here. So I'll click on Book. The Book module is a very powerful new feature that allows us to design and upload books to Blurb, which is a company that makes photo books, and also allows us to design and export PDFs. You may want to create PDFs to send to other manufacturers or to put on your iPad, etc. Now there's a tremendous amount of design functionality in here. I can click on the cover here, for example. Let me make the thumbnails just a little bit bigger here. I can click on the cover and change the format of the cover. Lots of different formats. I can click and drag photos into the book. So I'll click and drag this photo up and drop it on that book. I can choose to zoom in on it or not to zoom in on it. I can change the format of individual pages. So from a one photo page, I can change this to a three photo page with or without text, which is what the lines mean here. So I'll choose this three photo page, and I'll just quickly drag three more photos up here onto the page. I can add text. I can format that text with a lot of formatting options down here in the Type panel. I can also change the background on my pages. I can make the pages all different colors or make them all black. I can also put a graphic in the background. If I click on the drop down here and I choose one of the graphics that's built in, I could change the opacity on that. I could do that on every page as is happening now, or I can do it on individual pages by unchecking this and doing that again. Now if I care about this book and I want to save it, I have new output save logic here. I would click on Create Saved Book. I'll call this Up Close. And I'll go ahead and say Create. And it will show up here in the Collections panel on the left-hand side. So here's my saved book. I can get back to it at any time. Now one detail that I simply must tell you about, even though I'm trying to skip all the details, is that once you create a saved book, everything you do from now on is automatically being saved to this book. So if I like it as it is, but I start fooling around more, all of that work is being saved, and I may not realize that. So if you want to fool around more at some point, right-click on that and say Duplicate Book, and then fool around on the duplicate. OK, so the Book module is an exciting addition to Lightroom 4. Let's look at a few more useful features in Lightroom 4. I can select Photos, and I can right-click, and I can say Email Photos, and email photos straight from Lightroom. So I no longer have to export the photos as JPEGs out on my hard drive and then go open my email program. Now this allows me to email either from a client on my computer like Microsoft Outlook or Mac Mail or from a web service. So here in the From, I have Outlook because it's on my computer, but I have also set up my Gmail by going into the Account Manager and setting that up. For a web service, I can go ahead and put in the to and the subject, type the message, format the message. Here are the attached files. And then I have presets at the bottom that say what size those photos are going to be in the email. And I can change those presets, of course, to exactly what I want. Now this functionality does have some limitations. Now this functionality does have some limitations. Lightroom can't access your address books from your email programs. You have to create a separate one here in Lightroom. There are also other limitations. If you're using Outlook or another client on your computer, the email doesn't go into your sent email folder. If you're using a web service, the files are embedded rather than attached. So it's not perfect, but for that casual sharing of photos that I do all the time, it works just great and saves me that step of having to export. Now in the Export dialog here, you'll see that I have a couple more options up here under Export To. 
I can go to CD, DVD. Windows users, we haven't seen this in a long time, but you can burn copies of your photos to DVD straight from Lightroom. We can also now export to Adobe Revel, which is Adobe Carousel. That service allows you to share photos across mobile devices and your computer. Now the next thing I want to cover are new DNG enhancements for folks converting their proprietary RAW files to Adobe's digital negative format. We now have some new options. So up here in Preferences, I'm going to show you that under File Handling, we have the option for our DNG files to now embed fast load data. This embeds a preview of the photo in your DNG file, which allows it to load a lot more quickly in the develop module. So if you're used to waiting for your proprietary RAW files to load, this is another option for you to speed up that process. We also have the ability to compress our DNG files. I'm going to go ahead and go to a different set of photos here. I have a RAW file. I'm going to go up to Library and then Convert Photo to DNG. And in that DNG process, I have this new option, if I choose Camera Raw 6.6 .6 and later, to use lossy compression. Folks that know what compression is and know that your RAW file is your pure, highest quality file may feel queasy. I wouldn't use this for photos I really care about. But if you have outtakes that you want to keep around but you'd love to save some file space, or you have individual frames that you have for a time-lapse video, you don't need the utmost in quality, you can choose to use lossy compression here on your DNGs in Lightroom or on DNG copies that you send out. I have found that depending on the photo, this could cut my file size by half or even more. For folks that know what this is, it's equivalent to a 10 out of 12 on the Photoshop JPEG compression range. It uses that same compression. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK here and show you for DNGs that back here in the export dialog that I also have the ability to export DNG copies of smaller pixel dimensions. So I'm going to change this to export to hard drive and I'll come down to the file settings section. Let's say I want to export a DNG copy. Once I say camera raw 6.6 or later, I can choose to embed the fast load data. I can choose lossy compression. And if I choose lossy compression with this DNG raw file, I can actually make this a very small file in terms of pixels. Again, not something I would do to my the main copy of my photos or any photos that I care about. OK, I'm going to cancel out of this. Now, in my Lightroom 4 Fundamentals and Beyond series, I now have a couple videos on DNG. One that discusses the pros and cons and goes into all of the new features. And then also one on all of the how-to in terms of converting and managing them, and a new metadata panel, new filtering options, etc. Now, it just occurred to me that I missed a couple smaller changes in the output modules. So first, let me go to Print and show you that down here at the very bottom, we now have new print adjustment brightness and contrast sliders. So if you always find that your photos are too dark or lose contrast, and you don't want to have to make changes to each one in the develop module, you can simply set the brightness or contrast sliders here. So you would learn through doing test prints what this setting should be, you could set it here, and you could leave it alone. So that's to address the, my prints always come out too dark in Lightroom issue. The last thing I want to say, I've already said about book, that you could create a saved book, and then how this save functionality works in terms of automatically saving from that point on. That's also now true in the other output modules. So you can create a saved slideshow. It will show up as a special type of collection here, and will save your work on that slideshow. Same with the other output modules. So these are the major changes. I hope this gives you a good idea of what is now available in Lightroom 4. With the new pricing of $149 for the full version, or $79 for the upgrade, with everything that they've added in here, even though some of it I'm not so interested in, it becomes a no-brainer to go ahead and upgrade. So I hope this overview has been useful. Again, check out my website for more resources.